Now, it's going to be up for you to decide, is he really speaking to God, or is he having a series of very vivid dreams? He'll be explaining it, but he said it's like he would go to sleep, and then the next thing you know, he was heard noise in the kitchen, and he's walking downstairs, and there's God sitting at the table, and he has a conversation with him. And it was too vivid to really be a dream. But it's up to you to decide. This went on for quite a while. And it's really amusing the way God presents himself to him and then the information he provides. So that's what I put on the back of the book. Is it real or is it just a series of very vivid dreams? Whatever it is, the information is really good. And his God has a sense of humor. But it's up for you to decide what you want to think. Now, Michael is used to channeling, so he's used to being out. <laughs> so he said this is going to be very unusual for him to be awake and giving a talk. Because <laughs> he's used to just not being here. So he's going to be awake, so we've got to make sure he's going to do it okay. <laughs> I had no channeling today, just no channeling talk today. about the book. Turn okay, it on. so it's Michael Dennis, and his book is Morning Coffee with God. Okay. Namaste, and hello to you. Thank you, Dolores, for publishing my unusual book and for having me here. I am also a professional psychic. And I will be doing readings and spirit guide messages and spiritual mediumship at my table if anybody's interested. But I also will be uh, signing my book, Morning Coffee with God. And it started as a series of dreams in 2005. I was visiting a friend in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I just woke up one morning and I saw the white trousers, the white linen shirt, and I get emotional, I can't, I can't help it. So if I cry a little bit, blame it on the triple cancer. If it moves, I mother it. If it doesn't, I worry about it. And so I saw these penetrating blue eyes with a little bit of a silver tint. And he said, hello, Michael, I am God. And I thought, am I dreaming? Am I awake? Did someone put something in my drink? Do I need something to drink to get through this? And what? Oh, I also wanted to thank Dolores. I don't know if you can see it from here, but it's got the beautiful Michelangelo hand, the creation of Adam on the Sistine Chapel in Rome, Italy. And of course, we've got our little mystical cup with uh, the little mist and that kind of thing. So uh, let me just ask you before we get started, how many of you believe that we can communicate with divinity or God? Wow, lots of hands going up. How many of you have talked to God? How many of you still talk to God? Has God answered? And I say, what would it be like to have morning coffee with God? To meet with Him every morning and have the opportunity to talk to Him on any subject that you ever wanted to know? and to have him answer with penetrating depth, conversation, and insights, and a wonderful sense of humor. You know the old saying, the unity saying, or watch what you ask for, you get it? How many of you say that? Watch what you ask for, you get it. As a child, I found myself talking to God constantly. I had a horrible childhood. We all choose, I believe, to have our lessons, our learning, whatever. And I would talk to God, and at the age of 13, I said, well, actually, I didn't ask. I told him, uh, I'm going to college. That's your job to get me to college. It never occurred to me that I would not go to college. Now, that is a kind of faith that moves mountains, and I don't have it in every aspect of my life, and most people don't either. But what amazed me in the dream, or the dream, or the, because at one point I would wake up, have you ever had dreams where you were actually dreaming vividly and you woke up and it was still there? So, you know, that's the point where what is real, what is fantasy, uh, that's often happened to me. But he was telling me, he said, 
you have talked to me for a long time. When Geneva Jackson would come and take you to church, you would say, please get me out of this horrible home. Please, I want to go to college. Uh, I want to talk to you. I would like to meet with you. And I was kind of blown away because I had, I had forgotten that. And so that kind of said it. And then I was curious, you know, about the name. You know, God, what's, what's God? You know, God is love, God this, because there's so many, you know, connotations to that. And I was a little bit concerned. And it, to set off the sense of humor, God told me whatever. He said, well, between you and me, I don't believe in God either. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. So who did you talk to? Who did I talk to when I was a child? A lonely child before I went to the foster homes. He said, I am that I am is a more fitting version of my name. Because first of all, so many atrocities have been committed in my name and there's so many misunderstandings that some people don't even believe in God. But he said, for the purpose of this book, I would like for you to call me Mr. Divine. And I thought, Mr. Divine? All right, if that floats your boat, I'll call you Mr. Divine. And yes, of course, I doubted. I mean, how would you, how would you not doubt? But you know, sometimes it takes a dream to make something come true. And I had this little dream, and I was in detention, and there was this little perky, maybe because I had been a school teacher, I taught French for several years at all levels, and she put me in this, this uh, detention, and I'm like, what? She said, you didn't do your homework. I always do my homework. You know, what's the deal here? Neon letters, send your book out. So how many of you have had a dream, your intuition, your guides told you, and you followed it? Doesn't it tend to, tend to work out? So, as he went on in the conversations, and he said, I also come to you as God, as a father figure, because you didn't have a father. Your father was never there for you. He said, for someone else, I could come as a butterfly because God is consciousness. It's pure energy. It's all that he is. So I thought, I can deal with that. One lady said that. She said, well, why would God come as a man? You know, she was irritated because of all this, you know, male patriarchal macho stuff. And I, it's, so he, he pointed that out. And then he reminded me of something. When I was in my second foster home, I was 14 years old. I've always been fascinated by paintings. I was told I was a French Impressionist. Now I paint with words. I'm a poet, a singer. And uh, there was a painting of Jesus that hung on the wall in the bedroom. You know some of those paintings that just... The eyes, they look at you, and you, it's kind of like the Mona Lisa. You look one way, there's the eyes, you look another way. Well, this painting would look at me, and I would get cold chills, and I would look at Jesus because I prayed and I believed. You know, even then, I was very spiritual before I got so much into the metaphysical. And in the talk, one of the talks, I asked Mr. Divine about that. He said, well, to rock your boat, he said, that wasn't Jesus looking at you through that picture. That was me. And of course, you know, you think, well, I'm either totally losing it, I'm going absolutely crazy, but I thought, well, this is better than the shrink's chair. You know, I, was, I spent my time, you know, any time worth, anybody worth their sweat has, you know, I think counseling, therapy, psychic readings, you know, it, it's all very important. But here I was, I finally concluded, I said, well, if this is coming through, I always tell people, the bottom line is, you know, when I channel Mother Mary Kuan Yin, I channeled Mary Magdalene last year at the conference, it's like, Am I really doing that? It's like the message. I always say, you know, give Mr. Divine a chance. I invite people or clients. Uh, the ultimate is what, what are the messages. I'm going to read a little excerpt of that opening, beginning, because this will just give you an idea. I really didn't know what was going on. I mean, it's just one of those things where the higher self or you say a, a spiritual epiphany or a revelation, and this is exactly how it was. I wasn't sure if I had fallen asleep or if I was in that half dream, half awake state. It was still early in the morning and not yet daybreak. I rolled back in the comfortable position and snuggled. My face was chilled, so I buried myself deep into the warmth of the covers. Suddenly, I felt the weight of something sit down on the bed. I could smell the scent. I could hear soft, even breathing. I tried to open my eyes. I could do nothing. I was panicking. I tried to move. Something wasn't right. I was praying, oh my God, 
is this a dream that I will awaken from? My eyes seem to belong somewhere else. I thought, am I having a heart attack? Am I having a stroke? Am I dying? What's going on here? And then I felt something like a hand lay itself on my shoulder. And then there was this very brilliant light. And the light was becoming more and more natural. And then slowly, the form took place and he touched my face very soothingly and he said, do not fear, Michael. And I said, who are you? I am God. So I thought, okay, here we go. And then I thought of other times. How many of you keep a journal? Any poets? Any dreamers, muses? Since, you know, writing is such a wonderful way to tap the creative mind, the pure consciousness, Love. We'll talk about love, and I'll share an excerpt from something on love. But back in 1984, I realized after the book was going in the dreams or whatever was going, I had actually been having this contact for many years. I had the throes of unrequited love. Oh, that'll do it every time. I was in one of those back in the mid-80s, and I woke up at 5 in the morning, and I just started writing rapidly, you know, just, just scribbling. And I woke up half hour later, whatever, it was called Messages from My Soul. But the very last line, and it was very universal, it was taking the ego, it's like the higher self had just kicked in. Because I don't know if any of you have ever been so desperate or known someone so desperate that you actually, or they felt suicidal. But you know, the old saying, love whatever, love is blind. I mean, I was suicidal. Because the unrequited love is is very sad. Yes, it's karma in the other lifetimes I did those in and what goes around comes around and all that stuff. But one in the emotional throes of it. But at the very end, I remember writing, I am with you always, that which is. It wasn't God, it wasn't God, that which is. And then I thought, man, I had written this 25 years ago. So that made me feel a little bit better about going on with that. So speaking about love, how many of you have been madly in love? One time, two times, three's charms, and then I say, oh my God. <laughs> Any of you fit in the oh my God category? I definitely do. Love is a many splendid thing. It's the April rose that only grows in the early spring. Love is nature's way of giving a reason to be living. And what do you get when you fall in love? A girl with a pen to burst your bubble. That's what you get for all your trouble. Oh, never fall in love again. What do you get when you fall in love? You only get lies and pain and sorrow. So for at least until tomorrow, I'll never fall in love again, etc., etc., etc. Thank you. You can tell I'm a frustrated performer. I do have a singing telegram business in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I custom design and come out and all that. But I wanted to sing a little bit of that because. Mr. Divine had so much to say about love. And what was so fascinating was he would like to dress for the occasion. So for the love, he had on pink sweatpants, he had on a big white sweatshirt, and of course, what did he have in the middle? A big red heart. And he went on about love. He said Cupid comes from his upper distant realms, to shine upon human shores so that he might show off his cupidic beauty and form. Well, Mr. Divine was very good at creating his own words. So cupidic, he would come up with words like that, and he liked to play with that. And he said, love is really just getting a bad rap and needs to be understood for what it really is. He said, love both interacts with and transcends mortality. You know, I thought, that achy, breaky feeling, you know, all these songs and this searching, this yearning, you know, this 
It's always like you, you make me feel brand new. And I'm thinking, you know, we're looking outside of ourselves. You know, what, what is this? Well, you, you know, my beloved, my partner, you could drop dead tomorrow. Or as I like to jokingly say, croak. We're all going to croak. But Mr. Divine reminded me, because in the dreams what was interesting is we would talk about writings uh, that I had written. I would actually channel them or do automatic writing. And that's kind of in addition to the altered state or the dream state. We would actually, he would quote things that I had written. And, and, and as we'll talk about the war, we're going to talk about some war poetry. We're going to cover as much as we can in the time we've got allowed. And I do want to allow you question times. And so as we got to talking more, he said, Michael, you've got to remember that the conscious ego is one small aspect of your totality. You have this heart, you as in all of us, and soul. And he said, the more creative people, that's why, you know, when I deal with people with depression and despair and suicidal fantasies, I say, that is energy. You know, if we can get through this, there can be a lot of creative breakthroughs. So, you know, I welcome despair and rage and anger. And, and, you know, that's, I remember I asked him, I said, well, shouldn't we be talking about more celestial matters? And he said, healing the heart is a celestial matter. So it would always throw me off because I was kind of wanting to just, and so as he was pushing my buttons a little bit, he said to prove that you understand more about love, Michael, than the average person. You know, quit fighting it. You know, isn't it interesting that we have Cupid, you know, shooting that dart? You know, astrology, symbology, these are all, you know, means and ways to help us explain or to give a glimpse of our greater essence. And he said, you wrote something back in 1990, or I left my doctoral program in French to teach uh, or to pursue the metaphysics and to the psychic, the psychic readings. And on the day I uh, had told the professors I would not be coming back, I, ch I channeled. I'm supposed to be taking French notes on Moliere and the uh, playwrights of the 17th century. And here I just channel. I started writing. And the first one, or the second one, I wrote one called Oh My Soul. But the one that really grabs me, and I'm going to read you a little, just a little excerpt from it. Uh, it was called On Love. And I thought, oh Lord. If I write this, have you ever written anything that just blew you away? You're like, where did, where, did that, where did that come from? Anybody done that? It's like, and did you have to assimilate it? I would actually, this book, I was going to throw it away. I almost actually deleted the computer. I blame it on Dolores Cannon. I say with all her books, as far out as she goes, and these wonderful regressions in the convoluted universe books, I thought, well, my gosh, if, she, if people like that are willing to be open-minded, or mind candy, or whatever you want to call it, and then, of course, God said, he said, this is not just for you. This is to help other people. He, he said, the one, the one thing I want to emphasize, he said, the, <laughs> oh, he said, if I only get one thing across to you in this book, I want you to know that you are loved far more than you can begin to imagine. And secondly, you're not alone. And you know that, that cried. So if I'm crying in dreams, does that mean I'm really dreaming? Am I crying that I'm dreaming? Or am I dreaming that I'm crying? Or what's the Buddha thing, you know, the caterpillar dreaming he's a man? Or is the Buddha dreaming he's a caterpillar? So Mr. Divine would ask me, he said, get your little, book, little booklet out and read on love. You wrote it, Michael. Well, actually, he went into detail. We wrote it together since we're all part of God, or the energy, the creative force. He said, actually, we both wrote it together. And I remember, he said, you need to remind people of what's so important. They're all looking for someone else. He said, share this. Love is complete unto herself, remaining invisible to all who refuse to see themselves for who they truly are, total and complete souls. Empty hollow hearts will never see love through, their, through another's eyes until they first see love through their own. If you would be soothed by love's caresses, go within, searching and searching until you find her. 
call out to love. She will whisper and direct you towards her. Journey forward despite your doubts and fears, and you will enter love's sacred sanctuary. Persistent, diligent steps will lead you to the portal at love's sacred wedding altar where she awaits you. Her kiss will awaken you from mortal oblivion, and you will feel lonely no more. There at the sacred altar, your ego and your soul will be wed. And then you will search no longer outside of yourself for completion. For it is at this time and at this time only that love can make herself visible to you through someone else's eyes. In reality, your beloved's image will mirror your own gaze and you will you will mirror their reflection. For then you will realize that beloved and lover are one. So I thought, okay, the greatest love is within, Whitney Houston. What are you going to do? So I decided, fortunately, I didn't throw the books away. We covered many other topics. I want to get on a little bit. I don't, well, I do want to, since we were talking about, to finish up the love, uh, when I was teaching in uh, Vive, they call it Vivi, Switzerland County, in, uh, near Florence, Kentucky, I was teaching French, and it was Valentine's Day. And I said, oh, you know, the kids are out smooching in the hallways, and, you know, you happen to be the teacher, and I remember when we were that age, and we remember the little, I love you, do you love me, yes or no, and all the little candies and all that stuff. And I asked my guide, you remember, don't you, you're laughing. <laughs> How many times have you been in love? Oh, her eyes are turning, folks. Are you in the oh my God category, like Michael? But anyway, I ask for a poem, or I think I might have it memorized. If I have to glance, I will. But I said, please, Spirit, give me a poem about higher love. Not which we just spoke about, but I said, I want a, lo I want a love poem that's about something more than just me and you and a dog named Boo and all those beautiful love songs. Again, watch what you ask for. You get it, which I tell people constantly in the psychic readings. So on my study hall, I sat down at my desk, and I wrote, I, oh, I am a part of all that is, all that has been, and all to be born. The spark of life which leads us to this earth is the same spark giving birth to each morn. The life force causes the seeds to sprout, the roses to bloom, blossom, and fade. It is the same force which set this world in motion, the moon, the stars, and all planets it made. The life force takes the eagle to flight. It gives the sailor his love for the sea. When the spirit yearns to merge with the all, it answers the soul's fervent plea. It permeates the mountains, the hills, the wind. It directs the tide which forms rolling waves. It tells the story of life through art for self-expression and creativity it craves. I am a part of all that is all that has been and all to be born. When the spark of life takes me from earth, I shall be greeted by the new morn. Next time I'm not coming back as a triple cancer. These tears are just... So I wrote that and I thought, well, if I'm a part of you and you're a part of me and all that good stuff, then there must be hope. That's one of the things that kept me on the planet. I thought, you know, and plus, the old saying, what doesn't kill us can make us stronger. That's maybe a little bit trite. But you know, there's, everything happens for a reason. And the wonderful thing about regressions or readings or self-analysis is that when we can reach in, sometimes if it's a desperate case, in my case, I would have taken my life because I was so insanely in love. But you know, the, God intervened or whatever. And at that point, it, it, the door was just opening more and more and more. And then... I want to move on now to the next chapter, or whatever chapter it is. Did any of you see the 
Holocaust war movie in the 90s called War and Remembrance. Jane Seymour uh, starred as a Holocaust victim. And I think it was 88 or something. I was so haunted by that movie. And war movies, history has always haunted me. And I wrote three poems. I wrote one called The War Child. And I would see this young girl and she was walking up and down the street and her mother was dead and there was blood all over the place and she was lost. And I remember that poem, I just, it didn't feel like a poem. And I thought, what is this? So in the sessions with Mr. Divine, I said, well actually he brought it up first. How was it he put it? He said, we're going to talk about trapped earthbound souls. He said, heaven is a place where the souls go after death whose thoughts are aligned with positive vibrations. But those souls who are filled with rage, despair, negativity, they often go to a place that's not the light or heaven. And he said, they saw, oftentimes they don't even know they're dead. He said, yours is trapped and I said, oh, do we have to talk about the war child? Can't we let the dead rest? He said, the girl needs to know that she's dead so she can rest. I'm like, well, let someone else help her. I, that's not my job. And he said, she has stepped through time, through the stretches. She's reaching out to you. What are you going to do? Because I would go on the Internet and I would be, you know, asking people because, you know, the war child walks on in her world of, you know, won't someone take her from this forsaken land? This innocent child deserves a better life. The war child walks on with nowhere to go in this world of horror and strife. And I could see her and actually felt her presence at times. So he explained to me that this is what's happening. She had stepped through time. She was an earthbound spirit. And that I was to go like a spirit journey. And I was supposed to meet her halfway I said, well, you do that. That's your job, Mr. Divine. You know, your God is light. God is brilliance. God is the grand central sun. He said, my light is too bright. But yours will not intimidate her. Now, the actual experience and all that, I don't really have in the book. Parts of it I don't even remember. But what kind of blew me away was that, oh, let me watch the time. We're, we're okay. Uh, is that he would explain that. I wrote another one called, during the same time, uh, Jane Seymour, and I would cry, you know, when I'd watch. See, a lot of times, you know, historical novels and things, uh, they're past life, they can be past life memories. They can be parallel lives, and that's something Mr. Divine went into a lot of detail. When we talked about the darkness, we have a whole chapter called The Healing Power of Anger. You know, I, I grew up with anger. They say, the, the Hindus say that sometimes your last thought determines your next life. Watch what you ask for. I have five brothers. I'm the only one who looks like my father was a gorilla. I mean, I have, have hair everywhere. They say in my regression on my dying breath in France, I said, c'est le monde pour les hommes. Si j'étais homme, tout serait différent. It's a man's world if I were just a man. Now look at me. So spirit said, fine, you think it's just a man? We'll let you be a man. And a psychic told me 30 years ago, she said, you still have to deal with a tortured artist. So see, we bring it back. So some of these things, uh, like, say, the war movies, then these are lives we may have actually lived, or they could be parallel worlds. I wrote another one called Soldier in Contemplation, which just, I, I, it haunted me. I don't know that I have time to read it. Let's see, it's 11 o'clock. Uh, but anyway, well, it's a short one. I wrote it in the form of a letter. And I thought, and I was conscious, I mean, when I write, I'm always kind of like when I do a reading, I'm in a type of trance. But as I was writing it, again, I could see this soldier. I could see his long black hair, his, his greasy boots. And of course, in the talk, Mr. Divine had to show up in a G.I. Joe outfit. And he had to show up with his black boots. Because, you know, he, he liked to, like, depending on the occasion. And so, we got to talking about war. And he said, you wrote something called Soldier in Contemplation. And he said, it moved you very deeply actually on a very personal level. He says, I'm going to tell you why. But he said, first, I want you to read, the, read it. And I, I dug it out. Because what I would do is I would go back. A lot of them I had memorized. But some of them I would go back. And I just sat there 
and I was closing my eyes and I thought, okay, try to feel the energy of this soldier and try to breathe, breathe it in. And I wrote, dear God, will I ever understand war? How people justify destroy, how do people justify destroying life? We are all equal in your life, in your eyes. You gave us the breath of life and we take life in the name of greed and preserving peace. Young men, not even in the prime of life, are forced to fulfill someone else's dreams, which are given birth in the pits of hell. Fiery passion obsessions haunt the mind and torment the soul. How can anyone ask us to extinguish the human spark of God? Birth is a marvel, and we should cherish life. Life should be honored, for does not God dwell deep in our hearts and the chambers of our souls? Perhaps the battle will be won, but we will never be free. Nightmarish horrors of those deathly moments will be embedded in our souls and memories for the rest of this life. We won't know the real from the insane. Perhaps this reality is insane, and we who partake of war are no better off than those who ask us to kill. War is cruel, absurd, and humiliating. Please, dear God, let me rest in peace. So I'm like, what's that all about? He says, it's haunted you because this was a young soldier's last letter before he took his life. That was you in the past life. I said, oh, okay. That took a little while to absorb, but at least it understood. So whenever you read something, when one of the books touch your heart, especially if it pushes your buttons. Have any of you ever actually thrown a book across the room? <laughs> it just hit a chord. Uh, Dr. Pinkle asked us, women who run with the wolves, women empowering, you know, getting the, arch the archetype of the wolf archetype. When I first read that book, I was so out of touch with the creative, the deep, the goddess, feminine energy that it actually scared me. So I tell people if something pushes your buttons, like, you know, like even the concept of God. That's why when he said, I don't believe in God, neither do I, I thought that was quite humorous because of all the negative connotations. So we talked about fantasy. Uh, I asked to, I, I asked to uh, see him. I was like, well, you know, because he would, I mean, I would actually see him in the dreams and the, you know, he'd wear different outfits and, you know, the long golden hair, the blue eyes. But then when I was a kid, I remember going to my granny's, Mamma, we called her. And I remember going in the attic and looking. I mean, I would look under branches and trees. I would, in this cupboard, in the cellar, and I expected to find God. So he would, I say he just because of he, I could say God or it. And then as we got to talk, and he, again, that was part of the reminding me. And then he reminded me of something that you wrote. He said, well, you actually wrote something, or I helped you write something. And he said, let's, let's have a look at that. This is a short one. It's called Glimpse. Whence originates this yearning to behold the face of God? Do I really believe these mortal eyes could behold such luminescence? Would so much light engulf and annihilate me? Or would it perhaps burn through my mortality until it reached the seed of my very soul? Can the soul be perceived and felt with senses unscathed by mortal form? Can transcendental love and celestial realms, which poetry and song try to convey, dwell deep within my soul? Are there clues to help me discover the realms of the immortals? Are the whispers of the muses more than dreamy fancies? Can the voices that sing in my dreams soothe me with divine music when night sleeps? I hear no answers to these questions, but I feel a joyful sense of anticipation. Soon my longings shall know rest. My wandering mind serves me well, leading me to the immortal gates. The search is nearly over. Innocence opens the door for me to behold the face of God. I slowly open my eyes and step in front of an oval mirror where I behold written in silver 
the word love. I step inside, then question no more. And he said, I'm all that is. I can take any appearance, any form that I choose. And that answered. And wind up here before we take some questions. Uh, I wanted to visit his house. The last time he came, he had on a big brown robe, a white belt, and he didn't have the shoes. He had beige sandals. I knew the visits were coming to an end. And I said, what's it like where you are? Do you sleep? What's it, blah, blah, blah. And he, I said, could I come to your home? And he said, as a matter of fact, you are not asking the impossible. So, woohoo. So, I won't read the journey. I'll leave that with you. He did take me on a spirit journey. And it was rather mind-blowing. I really wasn't surprised at how beautiful the scenery, the setting was. And I just remember that at the very end of that, I was so blown away. And I was like, well, did we even have conversation? And I wrote, I'm not sure because I've just seemed to drift into the embers and take flight on sounds. I knew the misery of war and destruction. I knew the simplicity of peace and love the fire of the dragons of deceit, and the calm of those that believe in the power of faith. And then he smiled, and knowing that I love languages, he said, we don't say goodbye. You say goodbye. We say, au revoir, arrivederci, auf Wiedersehen, which all mean until God brings us together again, or until we meet again. That's why the foreign languages are so wonderful. This was such a mind-blowing experience the last sentence I wrote, because I didn't know what to write. I was so enthralled. I was so humbled. I knew I couldn't do myself in. I knew I had to, as the clients find out in the regressions with Dolores, they find out there's work to be done. I said, I asked, I received. I will forever live with the haunting realization of the indescribable. Questions, comments? Hello, Michael. My name is Inga. Um, can you give a little bit more? Um, background of the humor that God showed you. I can't uh, A little bit more stories or a, a background of the humorous insights that God gave you. I'm still not. No? Do I need to come down there? I can't hear. Does it pick up if I'm down here? You wanted more insight on? No, if, if you can give more humorous stories about the insights that God gave you. Oh! Oh, yeah, there were lots of things. I mean, because I would, I would be so taken aback, because, you know, I was constantly, you know, asking questions. And I would say, is that God really talking to me? He'd say, no, the guy standing behind you. I mean, he had such a sense of humor. I can't remember off the top of my head, you know, all the... I know he was very good at punning, because I, you know, I like to pun, and I like to come up with things like that. But he would, you know, he would say things like that, and... Uh, like I said, right offhand, I, I can't think of anything directly, but it's, it's very interspersed. And that's why, you know, I always say there's, there's got to be the humor and, and the lightness. And that's always the situation. When I channel Mother Mary, she came through and she said, the veils have got to go. She says, I'm a woman, you know, I've moved on since that time. And, you know, they put me on these icons. So there was always humorous in, in ways like that. Especially because he liked to play with... Uh, the fantasy real. You know, it's like Dolly Parton, they would say, oh, your fingernails real? Well, yeah, they're real, really fake. So, kind of stuff like that, a lot of punning. Anything else? 
Yeah, Michael, I don't know if you touched on it, but you were talking about every morning you'd come down, he'd have a cup of coffee ready for you. Oh, yes. And it'd be a different kind of coffee Oh, every yes, morning. and Mr. Divine <laughs> prefers Kona. He loved Kona. We had French vanilla, we had hazelnut, we had mocha cappuccinos, and we would hear the grinder, you know, and we'd have to have the natural spring water. I didn't include that in the talk. I just figured everybody drinks coffee. But it was kind of fun because he would ask me, I would, again, is this real? Because sometimes I would wake up and we would still be talking. Well, as my opera coach used to say, well, if you talk to yourself, they say you're a little bit wacko, but if you start answering yourself, woohoo, anybody does that? Oh, I do all the time. <laughs> so I figured, well, so a lot of the humor was based upon that, and then he would just say, take in, sometimes he would get very quiet, and he would just slowly put his hands around the mug and the warmth, and, he, and, and I could actually feel the actual, the hot, the, the coffee, and he would be brewing it. And then sometimes out of nowhere, he'd just disappear. You know, sort of, see you, see you later, alligator. Or think about that. But he played a lot with, uh, is it real, is it fantasy? And I'm at the point now where, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Well, there's a lot of truth to so-called fantasy. And we have an entire chapter. Uh, the, you know, the, the, I forget the exact name of the fantasy. Fantasy contains elements of truth. I'm not saying that every single fantasy story or whatever, but he wanted me to go. Uh, I had had some experience with some otherworldly beings as well as angelic visitation, and he confirmed that those were real. And he'd like to joke, what's the saying? You know, the angels take themselves, they fly because they take themselves so lightly. Uh, but I had had some experiences, and they do, you know, just... Why, you know, lie. that's why they, you know, tell us to lighten up, lighten up, lighten up. Uh, and I had had some otherworldly visitors, and they all had spiritual teachings, very deep spiritual teachings with humor. And a couple of them I had thought were fantasy. A couple of them even got published. And I never, just like the war poems, I never felt comfortable. I didn't feel like they were fantasy. But if you don't have a, you know, uh, I didn't have a paradigm, I didn't have anywhere to put them. And then he explained you know, in some of the conversations, he said, fantasy does possess elements of truth. And there's, you know, like, what is real, what is fantasy? I mean, we know people, if you believe something strong enough, you want, you want, desire, desire. You know, did anybody read the, uh, Lynn Grabhorn, the, uh, what is the name of that? Excuse me. What is it? Excuse me, your life is waiting. The feeling. And that's, that's the, the, the imparting of the hope. He constantly, and then he reminded me that uh, the teachings are for our growth and the, the despair, the darkness. He went into a lot about, you know, the dark side, the positive qualities of the, the dark side and, and, and a lot of details and some of my details from my life, which made me realize that, you know, things happen for a reason. You know, like if we wake up with some thoughts or, or you know, things we want to say. Okay, anybody else? How are we doing on time? Well, I think it was interesting, too, that you said every morning when you'd hear the coffee grinder and you could smell the coffee, you'd go in there, you didn't know what he was going to look like. No. He would have, sometimes you'd be sitting there with a sweatsuit on and uh, tennis shoes, and the next time he'd look like something else. Yeah. So it's not at all what you'd expect God to present himself oh, no. at. And He's like I said, they the say, table say the, say the, the last for the best, say the best for the last. At the very end, when he did come... <laughs> You know, he did come in, the, in with the big the robe and the, and the belt and the sandals. Uh, but the penetrating eyes, you know, when you feel when, when you're a soulmate connection, and we're all connected, but just I could feel. That's why it didn't become important whether it was a dream. When I finally decided to send it out for publishing, I thought, well, you know, the mind will just take you forever a spin. I thought, I don't know. I could try to figure this out till the end of the world. And... And I said, but again, you know, the, the teaching. So that's what I go with. And that's, uh, okay, anything else? We've got another one. Huh? She's Aquarius. They like to ask questions. <laughs> we just did a reading for her a little while ago. But I think it was, it, I know was the funny already. part because he never looked like you'd expect God to look like. If oh, you were no. going to make it up, you'd make him look traditional. And, uh, like when we went on the spirit journey, he actually had on the, uh, he had on blue sweatpants and 
uh, the, well, the sweatpants, and he had on the sneakers. I don't remember if they were Nike or whatever, but I knew we were going to be doing a lot of walking. And of course, you know, God is everything, so he had his own tricks. We actually kind of soared the spirit. I think he took me out of my body, probably. How many of you have had astral projection where you left your body? And, anybody there? Knock, knock, who's there? They say we don't, you know, unless the silver cord is detached, but I actually think that was... But yes, he actually would wear, when I saw those, especially those sneakers, and then, of course, with the war, with the G.I. Joe outfit and the black boots, uh, and then, you know, the love thing. Because, like I said, you know, there's been manly in love, one, two, three, and oh my God, and I definitely fit the oh my God category with the human love. And then when I saw the, the, the heart and the, 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 you know, God wearing white sweatpants, come on. I mean, uh, no, pink, and red, pink, all that red and pink and white. And, and then the coffee was real, too. Oh, yes. The coffee was I real. can smell it. Okay, come back. Come okay, back. Co come ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just nervous. I don't want to go over. But, I mean, that coffee was an imaginary coffee. Oh, no. Yep. No, and I would wake up. Like I said, sometimes it, I say morning coffee with God, but some of the times I would be, like, in the, in the evening or I'd just be sitting, lying back, and I would enter. I would feel him around or if I would have a question about something. or Because at that point, I would go back and other things I had written because I wanted answers. You know, I mean, I would go off in these... I wrote... I didn't talk about them, but I wrote one called I Am, I Am Life. And I actually talked about how I'm the wind, I'm the trees, I'm fire. You know, one of my guides is called Dresda, and she came into meditation, and she's like on the goddess level, and she says, I am flame, I am fire. I set in motion the heart's desire. So things like that would come in, and then uh, he just stirred it, stirred it up. He got the chicken soup going. And then, like I said, sometimes he'd just pop in, or a pun, something funny, uh, would just pop in. A word, word play, words that I hadn't heard of. Well, cupidic I could deal with, but there were a couple that I don't recall off the top of my head, and I'm like, where in the heck did that come from? Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I accused you. See, I Thank had mercury you very much. Thank you. I'm an airhead much. too. No, I was wondering how it has changed your personal life. S say that again. How did it change your personal life? Oh, I'm alive. Is that the only? Well, not the only thing. N no, it. I was so touched by what he said about he didn't believe in God. One of the funniest lines in the books, and that we're not alone, and that he loves us. I really felt, not in a Christian fundamentalist religious way, but I really felt I am a part of all that is, all that has been and all to be born. The spark of life which brings us to this earth is the same spark giving birth to each morn. Actually, it went from intellectual to heart. So every day I know that, it's like you said, I am as real to you as your capacity to receive me is. And your capacity is far greater than you can ever begin to imagine. I actually live that way now and encourage everybody else. And that's why I write my books. And I know that God can talk to us in different ways, different times. You know, some of the gospel songs, you know, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. If I never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve it. Now I go back and uh, at 13 I wanted to be a gospel singer. That was my big dream was to be a gospel singer. Now I go back and I uh, sing the gospel songs or I hear them. There's a lot of truth. Some of those old hymns. Now I still can't deal with amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. Excuse me, your life is waiting. We're not wretches. But some of those songs, so it really did. And I feel that we all have that connection and that's part of the ascension is rising up to where we can all. One of the poems was kind of fascinating because he said in the poem, he said, I was going up, he was moving my energy up. He was coming from, the, here's a pun, he was coming from the absolute to visit his relative. <laughs> there you go, you asked about humor. He actually said he was moving from the absolute, non-distinctual, void, notice there's no words, and he was coming into the relative, and I was actually, like the hand, the creation, I was actually coming up. And, and, I thought, and then we went into, you know, he actually went into a lot of detail uh, explaining that, how, you know, we are part. 
because I was having a little bit of a problem with how I'm a part of you and you're a part of me. He said, well, how about the day you said you're not only a part, you're a part of that leaf, you know, the rustling wind and the, you know, uh, and one of my regressions that came through, I said, uh, he said, what's it like to begin to have God or have the absolute so condensed that there's no sense of form, no matter. And just like someone had said, what time is it? In trance, I said, even when I was a rustling reed on the waters, I felt life. I could feel the touch and the sensuality of the wind. I never wanted to lose that total consciousness. So it's fabulous to be able to, I say, get higher than a kite, and in my case, get paid for it. <laughs> From teaching French to this. Anyone else? Are we done? It's probably about time. How are we doing on time, Dolores? Anybody else want to say anything? Sing a song. One of my special chapters, too, was on mourning. I, I, I'm not, and not mourning coffee with God. There's a pun again. Get me going on that. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Because I had, had a brother who died, and I lost a friend last year who, who died uh, right around Mother's Day. And uh, I actually had channeled something back when I left the doctoral program called on mourning, and he actually, I actually talked about how we can make contact if we send part of our spirit out, if we reach out to the soul that we miss, because if we ache too much, we can hold them back. You know, they've gone to the light, and so anyway, that one was one of the special, because I still cry, I cry every night. You know, again, watch what you asked for. My friend said, he said he, he was vain, he didn't want to live Marilyn Monroe, he didn't want to live past 50. He, and he would say, Mike, you're gonna miss me when I go. So you know, he, he put that out there. So you, you miss them. Does anybody still cry? Who cries over someone you've lost? Who, who, who'd you lose? And how long has she been in heaven? And you still miss her? Anybody else? It's natural. So that's the nice thing about being able to channel the higher self or God or whatever is to get the... Because I'll read it and I know that it's true, but I also know that we still miss them. You know, and he, he, he had a lot to say about the inner child. You know, the inner child, being a big kid at heart. Play, you know, go out and have fun. I mean, he was laughing about, you know, Valentine's Day. I picked up the phone and called complete strangers to get the wrong numbers, and I'd tell these women how, how beautiful they were. Some would say you're a pervert. A couple of them thought I was, okay, are we done? Okay, but before we leave, Julie has an announcement. Then before we go, then. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you for coming and...